Water is as important to life as is oxygen and food. Water is the major component of blood, which transports oxygen and other nutrients to all parts of the body and removes waste from the body as well. Water helps regulate body temperature. It also helps in chemical and fluid balances. Also, water provides moisture and lubrication to the skin and other parts of the body. Hi, I'm Kathy Getrist, and today we're going to be talking about water and other fluids in our body. Fluid intake is the amount of fluid, both water and other in, uh, liquids, that's taken into the body. Fluid is taken into the body through the mouth, through uh, a feeding tube that a patient might have, as well as an intravenous infusion into the vein. Normal adults take in approximately two to 3,000 cc's of fluid every day. These two bottles here that I have represent 4,000 cc's of fluid. Each one of these bottles holds approximately 2,000 cc's so that one whole bottle and a half of another would be normal amount of fluid intake for an adult individual. Fluid output is the total amount of fluid that is eliminated from the body. That elimination is in the form of urine, perspiration from the skin, um, also called sweat, through liquid stool, uh, called diarrhea, with emesis or vomiting, and wound drainage as well. Approximately two to 3,000 cc's of fluid per day is lost. As you notice, that is approximately the same as the intake. In order to stay healthy, the amount of fluid taken into the body needs to be just about the same as the amount of fluid that goes out of the body. About 50 to 60 percent of the adult body weight is made up of water. In an infant and in small children, that percent is even more. It's approximately 70 to 80 percent of the body weight is water. Whereas in the older adult, that body weight amount of water drops down to about 45 or 50 percent. Fluid imbalances occur when intake and output are different. The first thing I'd like to talk about is edema. Edema is when fluid intake exceeds fluid output. That means there's too much water that is retained in the body. When that happens, an individual will gain weight. Sometimes we're talking about five pounds of weight gain in the course of even one day. There's also swelling of the feet, ankles, hands, face sometimes. And also you might notice that there's a collection of fluid in the lungs. Many times you'll be able to hear rattling of the person's breathing and a chronic cough that is giving indication that there is fluid that's being retained in the individual's lungs. Dehydration is the opposite problem, and that's when there is fl a fluid output exceeds the fluid intake, when there is too little fluid in the body. When dehydration occurs, the skin becomes very dry, and there is a decreased urinary output. When there's a decreased urinary output, the individual will have a small amount of urine that is usually has a foul smelling smell to it. Also, the urine may be dark in color and very concentrated. In addition, another thing that might be uh, evidenced with a person who is dehydrated is that they may have dry lips, may have dry tongue, a mouth. They'll talk about their uh, having difficulty in speech and also will complain of being thirsty many times. A note about caffeinated beverages. There is caffeine in a lot of the beverages that we uh, take in. I think most notably is coffee. But there's also a lot of caffeine that is in tea, and many of our soft drinks have caffeine in it. 
and caffeine will actually increase the amount of urine output. So if an individual that is already dehydrated receives caffeinated beverages, the amount of output will become even greater than it might have been without that. The only way that the healthcare team can know when a patient's balance of fluids is not right is by measuring the patient's intake and output. Commonly, they just say I and O because intake and output is a mouthful. So frequently, you will hear them talk about someone being on I and O. A starving person can lose half of the body protein and almost half of the body weight and still live. But if an individual loses even one-fifth of the amount of water or other fluids in their body, they will die. Shows the importance to the uh, fluid that is a part of our bodies. Many times the healthcare team will help with maintaining fluid balance by increasing or decreasing the patient's fluid intake or by providing some medical interventions to aid in the elimination of fluid. An example that comes to mind would be sometimes patients are placed on water pills called diuretics. This is for people who are retaining too much fluid and it, it encourages the kidneys to um, rid the body of, of this excess amount of water. It's very important for members of the healthcare team to keep accurate records. Intake and output is recorded on the medical record immediately after the intake and output has, been, uh, has occurred. Intake and output totals will be added up at the end of every shift and then also at the end of a 24-hour period of time. Charting intake and output exercise is provided in the student manual in this lesson. This exercise will allow you to become more proficient in recording the amounts on an intake and output record. So take time after this lesson to practice on those sheets. A record of intake and output may be kept for days or even weeks as prescribed by the physician. The intake and output results will be evaluated by the nurse and physician for the valuable information that they provide. So accuracy is paramount. The most commonly used system of measurement in healthcare is the metric system. In the metric system, fluids are measured in cubic centimeters, called cc's, or in milliliters, or abbreviated mls. This is rather than in ounces, teaspoons, tablespoons, which if you recall, ha is a household system of measurement. In healthcare, household system of measurement is not used, but rather the metric system. One cc cubic centimeter is approximately one ml milliliter. I say approximately because if you look at the amount listed on the side of a soda can, it will say that 12 ounces equals 355 milliliters. And 12 ounces actually equals 360 cubic centimeters. So you can see there is a difference between 355 milliliters and 360 cubic centimeters but it's only five point difference. And for ease of calculations in healthcare, we think of milliliters and cubic centimeters as being the same. There are 30 cubic centimeters or 30 milliliters in one ounce. To calculate the intake and output, you will use the formula one ounce is equal to 30 cubic centimeters or 30 milliliters. Measuring containers are usually marked in both ounces and cub cubic centimeters. However, if you know only the ounces in a container, you will need to multiply the number of ounces by 30 to determine the number of cc's or cubic centimeters. And remember, 
This is because in the healthcare system, we do not use household system of measurement. We must convert things in the household system to the metric system. Let me give you an example. To figure the number of cc's in an 8 ounce cup, for example, you would need to multiply times 30. So if you had an 8 ounce cup times 30 cc's in 1 ounce, you would get 240 cubic centimeters. Use a calculator if you have difficulty with multiplication because what we're after is accuracy and you want to be as accurate as you can. Measuring devices are containers, cups, or graduates that are used to measure the fluid from the body. Some examples could be styrofoam water containers, soup bowls, a graduate, or a toilet hat. A table of common measurements is usually included on the intake and output form which tells you what each size of glass, cup, or, or bowl will hold when it's full. If your institution does not have a list of the amounts contained in each container, then you will have to determine that on your own, or uh, if you have difficulty with that, seek some assistance from the nurse. To determine a patient's intake, you must measure and record everything that is consumed by mouth that is liquid. That means you would be uh, including water, milk, juice, coffee, tea, and soups. Food items that become liquid at room temperature, such as gelatin and ice cream, must also be included as fluid intake. Although solid fluid consumes some liquid, most of the fluid intake comes from what a person drinks in the form of actual liquids. When you think about a potato, if you shredded a potato and squeezed it, there would be some water that would drip from that. But it would be a nominal amount and so you don't need to be concerned about the amount of fluid in solid food items but rather just the liquids. Some patients who are unable to drink fluids by mouth may receive them through an intravenous infusion in a vein or through a feeding tube that's been placed into the nose or stomach of the individual. In those instances, the nurse is responsible for recording the output and not you as the caregiver. The proper time to record the patient's fluid on the intake and output sheet is as soon as the patient has consumed the fluid. It's very hard to remember what fluid someone had at breakfast when it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you've done a whole variety of activities between those times. Don't try to remember this in your head. It's not a time for guesswork. So be sure to record the amount consumed as soon as it occurs. Be sure to know which patients are on intake and output because not all of them will be. Every time you remove a tray or every time you uh, uh, put water in a water container or remove a glass from a patient's bedside, you need to be thinking intake and output so that it's recorded each time the patient drinks something or has output, it is recorded and that accuracy is maintained. When measuring fluid intake, you will have to note the difference between the amount the patient actually drinks and the amount left in the serving container. Let's use some examples. Let's just say that for breakfast, Mrs. Jones drank a third of a glass of juice. Well, you know that a four ounce juice glass contains 120 cc's because four ounces times 30 cc's in one ounce will equal 120 cc's. Because she drank only one third of that glass of juice, you would need to divide 120 cc's by three, which would give you 40 cc's. That means that it was 40 cc's that she actually consumed. Let's also say that she drank a half of a mug of coffee. 
Well, if you looked on the uh, chart, you might find that an 8-ounce container or mug held 240. Or you would also know that 8 ounces times 30 cc's in 1 ounce would equal 240 cc's. Since she just drank half of that mug of coffee, you would divide by 2, and that would mean that you would record 120 cc's uh, of, of coffee that she consumed. Uh, the final example would be that at the end of your shift, you found that uh, she, you were going to be replenishing her water container. When the water container was full, it held 360 cc's of water. When you go in, you notice that there's 120 cc's left in that water container. And so you would have to subtract 360 minus 120 cc's means that she actually consumed 240 cc's of water. Math exercises are provided in the student manual if you need a little bit further practice on this. Never record the fluid intake before it is consumed. We can't be certain that the patient will consume everything that's on their tray. Record the fluids consumed at mealtime separately or together. In other words, you could put on the intake and output record that the individual took, let's say, 120 cc's of juice and that she took 60 cc's of water and that she took um, 80 cc's of, of uh, soup. Or you could just add those totals up on a piece of scratch paper and put down all of that total together uh, on the intake and output record. Check with the nurse in your facility to see which is the preferred method. Let the patient and family also know that intake and output is being measured. Some of the patients are able to assist in keeping track of the fluid intake and in fact they enjoy being a part of the process. Allow the patient to help as much as possible but be sure that you verify their accuracy before you allow them to do this. Ultimately, however, this is your responsibility as the caregiver and not the patient's to be sure that this record is maintained accurately. Now I'd like to turn our attention to talking about fluid output. Fluid output is the sum total of fluid that comes out of the body, as was mentioned earlier. Most adults will eliminate approximately as much as they take in. Fluid is discharged from the body in many ways. The most common one that we're aware of is through urine, but also fluid is lost from perspiration from the skin, evaporation when we breathe, through liquid stool called diarrhea, vomit, wound drainage, and many other ways as well. To determine the patient's fluid output, you must measure and record all urinary output and other fluids such as vomit and wound drainage. Fluid that is lost through perspiration or from breathing and through normal stool is not measured. You will measure the urinary output of the patient with an indwelling catheter by emptying and measuring the contents in the urinary drainage bag. This is usually done at the end of your shift. If you want to know more information about how that's done, refer to the uh, lesson on urinary elimination of an individual with an indwelling catheter. If the patient is incontinent of urine, and if you remember, the word incontinent means that the individual has lost the self-control of urination. You will not be able to collect it and measure it as you would with other folks. But it's still important to record on the intake and output record the number of times that the patient has been incontinent of urine on your shift. So what you would do is record incontinent abbreviation would be INC and then the number of times that they were incontinent on your shift. So it might be 
incontinent times three would mean that they were incontinent of urine times three on your individual shift. Never discard vomit, diarrhea, or any drainage before the nurse has a chance to observe it and begin corrective action. These um, outputs are not normal and would want to uh, be viewed by the nurse to determine what course of action should be taken next. If you notice any blood on a patient's bed linens, report and record the diameter in inches. For example, you might record and report that there was six inch round spot of blood on the bed sheets. Sometimes when the patient is on intake and output, only the intake is measured and the patient is allowed to urinate in the toilet. In that instance, you would record the intake on the intake and output record as you've previously learned, but you would just record on the output the number of times that the patient used the bathroom. So if the abbreviation is for bathroom is BR, you would put BR times two, for example, would mean that they'd gotten up to the bathroom and voided twice. Some patients are dehydrated and need to have more fluids added to their normal intake. The physician or nurse may give instructions to force fluids. In fact, you may even see it abbreviated FF. FF means force fluids. More accurately stated, however, it means uh, the term force fluid really means to encourage fluids since forcing someone to carry out an activity is inappropriate and would never be done. Sometimes a patient will need continuous encouragement and persuasion to consume the adequate fluids. Sometimes the physician will even specify the amount that they are to consume in a 24-hour period of time. For example, it might be written that the individual is to have 2,000 cc's of fluid every 24 hours. Ways that you might be able to help the individual consume more fluids is to find out what kind of fluid the individual prefers and notify the nurse or dietitian so that when available, they may have those items. Examples might be fluids that would be given at room temperature it's very common for elderly people not to like ice in their water, and they may not consume it if it's cold, but would if it was at room temperature. Also, sometimes people are encouraged to drink cranberry juice. Cranberry juice is a rather tart type of juice, and many times people don't like that very much, even though it is a very good juice if people have urinary tract infections. But if the individual's not drinking it, it's certainly not going to be of much benefit to them, and you might be able to find another type of juice that they would tolerate uh, much more agreeably. Also, people might be offered popsicles or fruit slushes. Anything uh, that they might consume would help encourage them to drink more. Also, encourage them to drink all of the liquids that they have on their tray. Limit the caffeinated beverages on their tray, things like coffee, tea, and soda drinks, as we mentioned earlier, will actually increase the urinary output and uh, will not help in retention of fluids. Offer liquids each time you enter the room. It's amazing if you have them take a sip of their water every time you come in, it won't be all that long before the entire container of liquid will have been consumed. Also have the family assist in encouraging patients to drink more fluids when they're there. There are times when it's necessary for the physician to order that fluids be restricted rather than encouraged for an individual. For example, a patient who may have heart failure or kidney disease may need to have their fluids restricted Physician order in that instance might read, limit the oral intake to 1,500 cc's in 24 hours. If the fluid restrictions are not followed, 
the patient may suffer fluid overload and an excess fluid may actually damage the kidneys and heart by increasing their workload. So it's very important to follow that fluid restriction. Frequently, these patients may be placed on drugs called uh, diuretics. We talked a little bit about that earlier. Those are the water pills. When given this medication, the patient will have a larger than normal urinary output to try to get rid of excess fluid that has accumulated within their body. Provide encouragement as the patient may feel thirsty with this fluid restriction. Your calm and reassuring attitude can make a big difference in how the patient feels and reacts. Usually their water pitcher is removed from the bedside so that the amount of fluid that is consumed by the individual can be better controlled. However, sometimes the patient may be allowed to suck on some ice chips or some hard candies to um, make their mouth feel, feel a little bit more comfortable. Frequent oral hygiene is often necessary as it helps keep these mucous membranes in their mouth moist. And it also might, you might find that a sign is placed over the bed of the patient who is on a fluid restriction as a reminder to every one of the healthcare team members as they come in. Now I would like to have you watch two demonstrations. The first demonstration is a measuring of the fluid intake and that will be followed by a demonstration of measuring fluid output. Collect the needed items. Explain the procedure to the patient. Determine the amount of fluid originally in the container. Obtain that information from the container or it may be listed on the intake and output record. Pour the remaining fluid into the graduate and measure it. Subtract the amount remaining from the amount originally in the container. Repeat these steps for each fluid on the tray. Record the time, the type, and the amount of fluid intake on the intake and output record. Remove and clean or dispose all used containers. Put on your gloves and explain the procedure to the patient. Gather the needed supplies from the bathroom. Pour the fluid into the measuring graduate. Place the graduate on a flat surface at eye level and read the amount in the container. Observe the fluid and obtain the nurse if there are any abnormalities. Discard the fluid into the toilet or a hopper and rinse the containers. Return the container to the proper place. Remove your gloves and wash your hands. Record the time, type, and amount of fluid on the intake and output record. 